Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by Peter Van Buren. He is a retired United States Foreign Service officer and author of Hopper's War. He also spent a year in Iraq. Please check out the description and go to wemeantwell.com. He's also a, a weekly writer for the American Conservative, along with the Spectator. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time today. Keith, it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm more than happy to talk with your listeners and uh, hopefully answer some questions. Well, uh, my main questions are about misinformation. I'm very terrified that there's misinformation going on out there. So I'm going to play a clip of someone and you tell me if this is accurate or inaccurate information. The clip's 48 seconds long. I'm not able to pause it. Uh, okay. Let's check out this first one. We've Us. never had a foreign government trying to interfere in our election. We have 17, 17 intelligence agencies, civilian and military, who have all concluded that these espionage attacks, these cyber attacks, come from the highest levels of the Kremlin, and they are designed to influence our election. I find that deeply disturbing, Secretary and Clinton. I think it's She time. has no you idea whether it's Russia, it, China, or anybody else. I am else. not quoting she has myself. No idea. I am quoting Hillary, you 17, have no idea. 17 intelli- Do you doubt 17 our, our military country has and no civilian idea. agencies? Well, yeah, he'd rather it. believe Vladimir Putin than the military and civilian intelligence professionals who are sworn to protect us. I did wow. 17 intelligence agencies confirm Russian interference in 2016? That really brings me back. Boy, did we dodge a bullet on that election. I, I hadn't uh, seen a clip like that for a very long time. You know, Hillary is right. She's correct in saying that no foreign government ever interfered in, in our election before. And in fact, that record still holds because the last election, the, two, the 220 election, the only government that interfered in it was our own. The only intelligence agencies that interfered in our election process were our own. And so in this odd way that things make sense in, in, in the world of Hillary Clinton, she's actually accidentally telling a version of the truth there. I want to now look at four years later, a very similar claim was made. You've done a lot of research on this topic sure. specifically. Here is uh, President uh, Biden. And I do want to start with the security of our elections and some breaking news from overnight. Just last night, top intelligence officials confirmed again that both Russia and Iran are working to influence this election. No, oh, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody. Take President the Trump, I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of race. Me. We're Take talking a look at about the, the issue from hell. President Trump, Nobody. we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Trump, you have to respond to that. Please, because look, very quickly. there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plant. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And that's exactly be. what is this that's where exactly you're going? What this is told. where he's going. The that, laptop right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia? I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President, again with Russia. Did Russia uh, interfere in the 2020 election? No, I'm afraid not. It was our guys who did it. It was our American intelligence agencies who interfered on behalf of the Clinton campaign, or I should say more, more against the Trump campaign than for the, hidden, the Clinton campaign. And what about the Hunter Biden emails? Was there anything in there that was worthy of mentioning? Well, there was quite a bit, uh, and we can go into this at, at great length, but I think the most important thing to understand is that it had nothing to do with Russia. What has been going on for the last four or five years or so of American history has been a classic magician's misdirection trick. You know, when the magician wants you to look over here, it means that he's doing something over there. And the whole point of it is to get you to look in the wrong place while he's doing his trick in the other side. 
it's very hard to do this backwards, by the way. I'll just uh, just mention that. Um, and so what we're seeing here is misdirection. We don't want people to be looking at what the FBI is doing to influence the election, what the CIA is doing to influence the election. We don't want people to look at Hunter Biden's laptop and its contents. What we want is people to be looking over at the Russians to see if they're up to anything. I notice uh, the announcer threw in Iran for some extremely superfluous reason. The Iranians have had never had anything to do with anything to do with anything here. But nonetheless, it's misdirection. And I think that's probably the more accurate term than misinformation, which implies that there is some information in there, just the wrong information. What was the most important thing you learned at, uh, when you were a Foreign Service officer for one year in Iraq? Well, I spent a full year in Iraq as a Foreign Service officer running two uh, independent reconstruction teams. And both of those teams were charged with basically winning the war. We had given up militarily at that point. I was there from 2009 to 2010. And what we were going to do, I guess what I was going to do, is, is I was going to uh, simply win the war by purchasing the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people by building schools and roads and sewer systems. Had any of it worked, uh, it's hard to say if there would have been any successes. But the thing I learned more than anything is that you can't simply win a war with money. If your aims are impure, if your people are unskilled, you're going to lose that war no matter how much money you do spend. I mean, in the end of the day, if we had set the money on fire with a match, it probably would have done just about as much good as we did spending it, quote unquote, uh, thoughtfully over the period of a year. And when you had uh, left the uh, State Department, what have you learned about being a uh, former employee uh, for uh, the State Department? Was there any harassment? Uh, uh, you hear about these sure. things, but heaven knows if they're true. Well, I sleep a lot better as a former employee than I did as an employee. So I, so I strongly support uh, better sleep uh, and, and healthier living. You know, the State Department made my departure about as difficult uh, as they could have. By the time I had written the book, We Met Well, about my year in Iraq, it was pretty clear that my career at the State Department was over. I had burned a lot of bridges in the process of writing the book. I pulled no punches, and in pulling no punches, I landed a few punches, and that pretty much made me persona non grata in the State Department. If by some accident I had been kept on the uh, on the books, I would have been assigned to some horrible back hole where, where malaria was the main topic of, of conversation or something along those lines. So it was, it was time for me to leave. And I think my employers at the State Department had no doubts in their mind that they wanted me to leave. Um, but unfortunately, they made that process as painful as, as possible. It started out with an attempt to, keep, to take my book uh, off the shelves. That failed uh, horribly due to this silly First Amendment thing. I don't know if your listeners have heard about that, but it's kind of a big deal. Um, after the First Amendment saved my book um, and then saved me from prosecution for the book, the State Department pretended for a while there was classified information in the book. There was no classified information in, in the book. Um, they sent my case to the Department of Justice in hopes of scaring me. I had a, a couple of ugly, ugly sit downs with some very, very unpleasant men who told me things like, you know, you'll win in the end, but you'll be bankrupt when it's over with. And so if your goal is to uh, prove a point here and ruin your family, send your kids, uh, make sure your kids don't go to college and lose your home. Congratulations. You'll probably come out ahead in the end. But we're the government. We've got plenty of lawyers. We can file motions against you in, in courts that you, you can't even travel to so that in the end of the day, you'll be broke. You'll be despondent. You'll be divorced. But, yeah, you'll have your moral victory. So why don't you just give up right now? And those are very tough things to hear. You know, I think of myself as a fairly resilient person. One of the things I did learn in my 24 years as a Foreign Service officer is to kind of roll with punches. Um, you wake up one day and you're in a country where there's a revolution going on. You, you learn how to, how to account for that. Um, you're in a country where an earthquake happens and there's 5,000 people killed around you, as was in Japan. Well, you learn to deal with that um, and make the best of it and do your job as best you can. Unfortunately, when you've got people with badges talking about your children, talking about your family, talking about your, your wife, all of whom are, are so innocent. We, we made a deal, uh, my family and I, that I wouldn't really talk about work at home. 
Um, and that way they would be free to say whatever they wanted to say at school or at, at, with their friends or, or what have you, because it'd be a guarantee that nothing at home said was ever going to be sensitive or classified or even you know vaguely work related. So they were so innocent on all this. And to hear federal agents basically saying, we're going to run you into bankruptcy and your kids won't go to college and you'll lose your home. That, I have to say, for the first time, really kind of scared me uh, a little bit and made me thought about quitting under their terms, which were basically to give up the pension that I had earned, the health care that I had earned, uh, the years of service that I had accrued and the benefits that, that were due to me. Um, in the end, I met with some very good lawyers, and though uh, I'm told I have a bit of a sense of humor at times, the one thing I no longer do is make lawyer jokes, because they saved me. Uh, two lawyers uh, who work now with other whistleblowers, they've gone on, in fact, uh, both of them, uh, Jess Raddick and Catherine McLennan, have gone on to represent Edward Snowden. They're working now with whistleblowers in the drone program. Um, they saved me. Um, they saved me first by giving me the courage to stick with it. And then they saved me with some deft legal maneuvering. And then they saved me by eventually recruiting the American Civil Liberties Union. And at that point, even the State Department realized that they'd been beat. The American Civil Liberties Union, at least at that time, um, was a very powerful organization for good, for, for, for free speech. And they uh, agreed to uh, contact the State Department on my behalf. And all of that really caused those men with badges to realize what tiny little lives they lead. And they all shrunk back to their uh, shovels in, in uh, Alexandria and left me alone to uh, leave the State Department on my own terms and uh, pick up a second career now as a journalist and a writer and uh, opinion uh, person, and hopefully spread some of the uh, information and some of the thoughts that I've learned over the years in my 24 years serving the United States overseas. You spent a lot of time with uh, soldiers in Iraq. If you had to explain uh, what the primary cause of veteran suicide was, I've heard quotes, it's like 22 a day, something ridiculous. Yeah, if you horrible. had to explain what the primary cause was and what, if anything, we could do to sort of put a halt to this terrible thing, what would you say to someone? Boy, I wish I had a, a quick answer for that because it would save, it would literally save lives. I spent a full year in Iraq embedded with two uh, military units. And in the entire time that I was in Iraq, the two units together suffered only three fatal casualties. All three were suicides. All three men took their own lives. And I think I think every suicide is unique in its own way, but I think with the soldier suicides, there, there's some commonalities. One of them is just an incredible sense of loneliness. These are young kids. Mm -hmm. Some of them are 18, 19 years old. They're coming from very uh, small towns, rural areas. They've never really been outside of, the, of their own little family and, and, and friendship bubbles. And suddenly they're in the middle of nowhere with not a whole lot to do. Um, the work that they're doing is oftentimes confusing, sometimes ambiguous to them. I think a tremendous sense of loneliness pervades them. And to the extent that the military continues to find ways to improve morale, in, well, it sense morale is the word that's best easiest to use, to make communications better, to make it easier for people to talk to their loved ones at home. I think that's a good, good thing. I think the other thing that sometimes troubled soldiers, and as the only civilian there and the only person among a group of, say, 5,000 who was not in their chain of command, some people sought me out in kind of a rabbi or priest-like capacity. They had no one else to talk to that wasn't going to either be above them or below them in the chain of command. And I had a lot of time free time because the State Department really didn't have much for me to do, actually, in most days. Um, and, and so I spoke a lot to these young kids. And I think the more that they understood what was going on, the better off they were. There were an awful lot of them who had no idea really what was happening around them in Iraq. Their job was to, to for example, operate a radio or to repair trucks or, or something along those lines. Very important cogs in a very big machine but they didn't understand what the big machine was doing over there to begin with. 
And they started, I think, sometimes to blame the big machine for their loneliness. You know, it's like, well, I can't see my loved ones because I'm here in Iraq and I don't know why I'm here in Iraq. Uh, my job is to fix trucks and I do that fairly competently, but it doesn't seem to move the process along in any way. And nobody could say to them very clearly, well, our goal is to capture Berlin, you know, like it wasn't in Saving Private Ryan. And instead, our goal was to reduce the amount of terrorism in Iraq and to win the hearts and minds and to promote democracy. And oftentimes that stuff just, just kind of washed off their backs. And so I found that often when I sat down and talked with them about this and admitted from the beginning that many times our goals were contradictory, many times what we were trying to accomplish was, was hard to define, ambiguous. Many of them seem to, I, I don't want to take much credit here, but seem to walk away with a better sense of, okay, I, I kind of understand a little better why I'm here. And I oftentimes would help them focus on the fact that, hey, it's a year. Every day ticks by, every minute ticks by. If you can't get through the next hour, get through the next 10 minutes and uh, we'll get you home. Unbelievable stuff. I want to talk about the origins of that conflict and I want to try and steel man the position. Uh, George Bush allegedly wrote a book, uh, Decision Points, and he has a uh, section titled Iraq where he says- I hope you stole that book. I hope you didn't buy that. Ah, I'm ashamed to say that I bought this. So oh my goodness. Won't to... happen again. Return it and pick up another copy of Ron Paul's autobiography. I want to steel man this position uh, because there are still defenders uh, to this day. Yeah. I want to see how you respond to this passage in the Iraq section. The moment hit me. For more than a year, I had tried to address the threat from Saddam Hussein without war. We had relied on international coalition to pressure him to come clean about his weapons of mass destruction programs, we had obtained a unanimous United Nations Security Council resolution, making clear there would be serious consequences for continued defiance. We had reached out to Arab nations about taking Saddam into exile. I had given Saddam and his sons fi a final 48 hours to avoid war. The dictator rejected every opportunity. The only logical conclusion was that he had something to hide, something so important that he was willing to go to war for it. Mr. Van Buren, we had just been attacked on 9-11. We didn't know what was going on. He's a dictator with weapons. We had to go in. Well, of course, none of that is true. And that's really the problem here. It, uh, let, me, let me kind of circle off back on that a little bit to say why we care about this. Because, sure, these are the events you're talking about happened back in 2002, 2003 in the run-up to uh, what was Gulf War number two. And it's all water under the bridge. Mistakes were made. Things happened. Time to forgive and forget, move on, all that good stuff. But that's really not why we study history. We study history to learn from our mistakes. And the hope is, is that we will not repeat the same mistakes. So we need to look at these things carefully and we need to take them seriously, even though there are people, particularly people who got fooled back in 2003, who want to tell you, hey, it's time to move on, uh, it's there. So basically everything that you read in that passage was false. And George Bush, we have a choice now to either say that he was a complete blithering idiot who believed things that were perversely not true and obviously not true and told to him to be not true, or that he was so dumb that he believed things that had no factual basis and ignored dissenting information. Um, decisions are hard to make. Uh, I'm reading a fascinating book right now called How Doctors Think, and it's all about uh, how doctors make mistakes because of biases in their own thinking. They, they start down the road of thinking you have a heart problem, and that keeps them from paying any attention to the problems in your stomach, and eventually, you know, you die of stomach cancer. And that, that, that kind of thing, decision bias, I think it would be the more uh, pedestrian term for all of this kind of thing. And so Bush either suffers from a near-terminal case of pedestrian bias, or he's lying on purpose. We have two choices here. There's really not any third uh, option, because in that period of time, the information that George Bush was getting was ambiguous for many government agencies. The CIA alone was claiming it was, quote, a, a slam dunk, unquote, uh, George Tenet's famous remarks. 
But for example, my own State Department's Office of Intelligence and Research was directly stating to the White House that there were no weapons of mass destruction. The uh, British were producing uh, good intelligence up until what was known as the dodgy dossier, uh, which gave, which suddenly reversed all of their uh, previous opinions on it. And when you've got one thing that says something and everything else that says another, you want to be real careful about picking up on the one thing that agrees with you. So George Bush was lying about all that. There were no weapons of mass destruction. The UN inspectors, which included a number of uh, highly skilled Americans, many of whom had previously worked for the U.S. military, U.S. intelligence agencies, many of them were former all three letter agencies you can think of um, who were extremely knowledgeable about these things. They went over under the guise of the UN and they came home and said, we found no evidence of weapons of mass destruction. And we looked and these are big, heavy things. You know, it's not like hiding a, a thumb drive someplace. We're talking about centrifuges and power plants and uranium processing facilities, big, heavy physical things that generally can be seen by satellites, never mind people on the ground. And we're just not seeing evidence of that. If they're buried, we're not seeing evidence of any construction work that was done. So there was an overwhelming sense of evidence available to George Bush. And now, in, in retrospect, we can see it as, as members of the public that made it very clear that they were very unlikely to be weapons of mass destruction. So, of course, Saddam was not going ahead with agreeing with anything because he was talking to an absolute raving lunatic. It's, it's like you're sitting there comfortably in your studio, Keith, and I say, well, Keith, you've, you've got to get out of the studio because it's blazing on fire. And you kind of look around and don't see any flames and you don't smell any smoke and the smoke alarms haven't gone off. And you say, well, I refuse to leave this studio um, because it's, uh, you know, and I say, well, it's on fire. And if you don't leave, I'll have no choice you know, but to invade you or something like that. I mean, this is the kind of absurdities. I feel stupid saying these things. But, I mean, this is the kind of absurdities that were overlooked in the rush to war in, in 2003. So I'd love to read that. I'd love to switch places with George W. Bush right now. I would, I would uh, give some serious money to see him sitting here across from you. You read that passage aloud to him and get him to react to it right now. So uh, I agree with you that uh, the uh, lying took place. I uh, certainly think it was deliberate. Uh, you, you'd think we'd get more apologies if it was such an honest mistake. Uh, I have uh, I have two more videos. So uh, this one is a final word on Iraq. Uh, this is what my reasoning for saying that it was just a lie. And then I want to ask you, what do you think is the motivation going on in the heads of these three uh, people here? I don't think we ever said, at least I know I didn't say, that there was a direct connection between September the 11th and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of al-Qaeda. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, it's absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed, that he did go to Prague and he did meet with... Um, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad and, and uh, east, west, south, and north somewhat. What is the motivation behind those guys? I'm loving, I just have to say as an aside, I am loving these clips and the way you put this all together. And I'm also hoping that I forever stay on your good side because there are hours and hours of video of me talking about different topics. And I can just see some future, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson Jr. Or, or Keith Knight Jr. putting together a, a set of clips that make me look as dumb as these guys. But on the other hand, I feel pretty comfortable in saying I could never be as dumb as these guys, even if I, I tried. Essentially, what you're seeing from Bush and from Cheney and, and from Rumsfeld is essentially, you know, we'll lie about it today because nobody's going to remember it tomorrow. The clips that you've put together here are something that are available to anybody with a few uh, hours and, and some willingness to spend some time on YouTube. But at the very same moment, will never be broadcast. Uh, the mainstream media would never show that 20 seconds worth of, of lying that you had clipped together. 
and Cheney and Rumsfeld and Bush and, and all those people and the new group today and the, and the group that'll be there after them, uh, after the next election, know that. They know that the public's attention span is short, that their memory is even shorter, that the news media, the mainstream media is largely uh, has them in their pocket and they're not going to embarrass them like that. They're going to let them get away with their lies and their lies are temporarily purposeful. When they say that the weapons of mass destruction are there, we know where they are, they're right around to Crete, that justifies the coming war. When they say later, well, we didn't really know where they are, that justifies the fact that no weapons of mass destruction were found. And they take full advantage of the fact that Americans are, are not, don't pay very much attention, and that, excuse me, the media will cover for them. It's a really sad state of affairs when it's up to people like us, and I don't take any credit and I'm not bragging here, but when we've got to sit, sit down and get our hands into the mix of, of videotape in order to simply bring out the very basics of, of truth, and we're not even trying hard here. Like I said, this is really just a little spelunking around YouTube. Good for you to do it and good for people to have seen it, but my goodness, why isn't that on CNN or NBC? Certainly, it's uh, it's really incredible. Now, uh, if you look at the Hunter Biden laptop issue, I'm not too concerned, let's say, uh, that he was a murderer. Well, look, if someone's son does something bad, they should go to jail. But that's not anything that, um, that you know, I would disqualify someone for a position for. They'd have to sort of disown the son, at least publicly. But what we had here for all of Russiagate were the top intelligence officials. So it's, oh, politicians, yeah, they lie, but they don't really have the information. So now we not only have the politicians, but the intelligence officials. I don't know how much you can speak to FBI, CIA, et cetera. But when it comes to people in this state, department apparatus kind of thing. Uh, what is a uh, general theme among these people that you recognize? The good, the bad, what does the average person need to know about who we're dealing with? Well, what I saw in my own career in the State Department was very different than what I've been seeing most re more recently from the intelligence services. What I saw during my career in the State Department and what I participated in myself for many of the years when I was a good little boy and doing my job was a blind willingness to support whatever was coming out of the White House. We were reminded on a daily basis by our bosses and our bosses' bosses um, that we were a cabinet agency at the State Department. We were a cabinet agency. We worked directly for the executive branch. And our job publicly was to support the executive branch. Uh, we were told that if we had dissenting opinions, uh, there were ways to, to make that information known internally. But externally, particularly when talking to the public uh, through the media, our job was to support the White House. Uh, and that was that. It was very, very simple. And don't even think about going out in front of a camera and, and saying something that is in opposition to what the White House is saying. Um, that's okay. I think the public understands that. I think generally people at the State Department would frame it that way. You know, well, according to the White House, our policy towards country X is blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, as a way of sort of covering ourselves. What we didn't do was to manipulate through lies. At least what I didn't see done during my time there was directly manipulate through lies. Uh, public opinion and to sway votes. And that's what we saw here. We saw James Comey uh, exonerating Hillary, Hillary Clinton of any crimes at all in July 2016. We saw the FBI in the same month open an investigation against Donald Trump's crossfire hurricane in an attempt to prove that he was a Russian sleeper agent. We saw James Clapper, uh, Comey, and then also John Brennan meet with Donald Trump just before he was sworn in as president and essentially try to blackmail him by saying the Russians have the so-called P-tape, and forgive me for that language, um, and they are gonna they may release it, but we know about it too, uh, so don't let us say it first, okay? Um, kind of right out of J. Edgar Hoover's old uh, playbook where as FBI director during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, J. Edgar Hoover would go to policymakers in Washington and say, oh, by the way, uh, in the FBI files are these photographs of you with your mistress. They'll remain in the files as long as you remain a friend of the FBI. Have a nice day. Um, we saw the intelligence services 
in their most blatant form, jump in with the Hunter Biden laptop only uh, about a year and a half ago, where 51 mem from members of the intelligence community, FBI, CIA, NSA, all the uh, three-letter agencies, all stood up, put their names on a document publicly saying that they believe the Hunter laptop is has all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. You know, they're, they're all lawyers, so there was just enough fudge in there that nobody's going to jail or nobody's going to be sued over any of this. But to the American public, that was a huge voice, an authoritative voice. You heard Joe Biden cite that authority in the clip you paid, er, uh, played earlier. Cite that authority as a way of saying, don't pay any attention to the man or the laptop behind the curtain. And it worked. So imagine that um, Joe Biden sees this video and says, oh, heavens, Van Buren's been right this whole time. He's now head of the State Department. Then he sends you to go talk to Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister for the last 20 years of Russia. What do you say to Sergei Lavrov? <laughs> oh, 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 okay. And just so you know, the reason I'm asking is because there's this whole thing of, well, why hasn't Anthony Blinken at least gone over there? What is uh, Jake Sullivan doing to try to end this thing? Of course, you know, it's not directly their fault. We're talking, NATO we're talk, we're talking about the Ukraine here. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I didn't know if there were other sins I was going to be responsible for overnight oh, or, or not. Just, just Ukraine. No, no, no. Just the uh, just the Ukraine thing. But okay. the the, uh, the the general uh, idea is we're this country with so much power and we're always wanting to get involved, allegedly. And now you're not trying to get involved at all to see if you could get a ceasefire going sure. here with Lavrov. So what, what do you say to the Russian foreign minister to try to get this thing peaceful? What I would do is I would, uh, first of all, make sure that we were in a place where if anybody was recording anything, it'd be only my side. And I wouldn't even really trust my side to be recording. And I would say to him as directly as, as, as I felt possible, look, we need to bring this to a conclusion. It's starting to become a drag on both of our governments. There's an awful lot of people dying. What do you want? What's your bottom line here? And after he gave gives his first bottom line, I'll, I would basically say, now what's your real bottom line? And my goal would be to try to find out as accurately as I could what the Russians want to conclude this war. Obviously, I don't believe that what they want is a springboard into Western Europe and that the next thing Putin has planned is tanks rolling through the Arc de Triomphe in Paris or anything along those lines. I don't believe they want to use chemical or nuclear weapons. Um, I don't believe, personally, at this point, they believe that they even want to take control of the whole of Ukraine. That may or may not have been a goal six weeks ago, but certainly at this point today, I think what I would do is say to him, we want to facilitate a way to bring this thing to ground. We want to stop seeing Russian soldiers dying. We want to stop seeing Ukrainian civilians and soldiers dying. Um, we understand you've made some uh, military progress here. We understand the Ukrainians have put up a, a good defense. So where do we call this one? over. You don't want this to be 20 years in Afghanistan. The American side doesn't want it to be our 20 years in Afghanistan. So we both agree we don't want it to be Afghanistan. How do we get to that point? And I have found in my own limited bits and pieces of diplomacy, now I have to be very clear, in 24 years in the State Department, I never negotiated with heads of state or anything along those lines. Um, but I was involved in, in some fairly routine business of diplomacy that was negotiable with, with people at my own uh, middle levels. And we all represented our governments and we all knew what our, our final offer was, the one we had in our, in our back pocket. And we all knew what we would prefer to come out of it with, the one in our front pocket. Um, and we all had experience in getting to one or two of those those places and, and seeing how it worked. And I would apply those same basic diplomatic techniques with the Russians um, there. The idea of trusting anyone is, is kind of silly. Uh, you know, you trust your mother, you trust your scoutmaster or something like that. But in terms of international negotiations, you don't have to trust people. What you do is you have to find out as best you can um, what they want. And if you can get to a point where you believably believe you know what they want, 
then you don't have to trust anybody. And you can get to that through intelligence. You can get to that through negotiations. You can get to that through just good old sit down and, and, and logical thinking. In the specific instance of the Ukraine, I'm just speculating here, but I think what Russia would be willing to settle for at this point is some form of control of the eastern rim of Ukraine, including uh, Odessa and Mariupol. We could find the right words for that. Um, and some type of uh, statement from the Ukraine that they have no current plans to join NATO. And after that, if you can, if you can get a mm, on that, the rest of it is really just negotiating terminology and word choices so that both sides save enough face uh, that they can go back home and, and claim victory. That's what you ultimately want, is both that both sides are able to claim victory. This idea that we need to go in mm. there and embarrass and humiliate Putin or any adversary, um, that doesn't really work. That only really works when you whoop the entire Iraqi army into, into meatballs and shredded the Revolutionary Guard and blown up their 40-year-old old Russian junk equipment. Yeah, go ahead, humiliate them, have some fun with it. But when you're dealing with peers, like the Chinese, like the Russians, like the Western Europeans, you cannot go in there with the goal of humiliating someone or, or, or embarrassing them or leaving them looking so beaten up by the process that all they're going to do is walk out of that room and start planning the next round. And then assume you have to go to China and talk to President Xi and we say, hey, your mission is to make sure he doesn't go into Taiwan. Uh, I get that there's a lot of overlap with your previous answer, but is there anything additional or anything different you do in this case because he hasn't necessarily gone totally sure. in and started killing civilians? I've got an article out uh, as of August um, 18th, If I'm sorry, August 25th, if, if uh, listeners are interested, specifically addressing the question of China and Taiwan on the American conservative. And so I'm going to be drawing from that in my answer. And if people were interested in this topic, I served two years on Taiwan. I served in Beijing. I served in Hong Kong. Um, I speak a little Mandarin. Um, I spent a lot of time in East Asia. And so I feel much more uh, empowered to answer this one than I did with the Ukraine question, where I had to essentially draw up on more broader principles. I think with, with President Xi, I could be even more specific. And I could say, look, Taiwan sees China as its largest trading partner. China sees Taiwan as its, I think, third largest trading partner. You are the largest holder of U.S. government foreign bonds. We have an extraordinarily complex cultural relationship, economic relationship, and you have one with Taiwan that's even more complicated. 25,000 mainland students study in Taiwan. Nine airlines run direct flights across the state, across the Taiwan Strait. You have business ties, social ties, historical ties. You have absolutely nothing to gain by tempting war with Taiwan. The United States practices a policy of strategic ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis China and Taiwan. We have not stated directly that we would intervene the way we have, for example, with NATO Article 5. If the Russians were to attack Poland or Germany, the NATO Treaty Article 5 says that we will get involved directly um, and go to war. With uh, As compared to China and Taiwan, our treaty with uh, both of them basically says that the United States, in, in lay terms, basically may get involved probably would get involved, but we're not going to actually promise to do it um, in order to give everybody a little wiggle room in there. And I think that wiggle room is where all the money is really, really made. If you say, if you draw red lines, you have two choices. You can either go to war on the red line, like NATO plans with Article 5, or you can become kind of an international embarrassment, as Barack Obama ended up being when he drew a red line in Syria and then turned around and said, nah, never mind, I didn't mean it. Um, the nice thing about what we have with Taiwan, strategic ambiguity, is there is no red line. It's a very fuzzy line out there. And if Taiwan does A, we're free to do B or C or do nothing. And the same thing regarding uh, any kind of so-called provocations. We're welcome to respond to them, to ignore them, um, to take whatever action we feel necessary. And I would remind President Xi of the complexities of our three-way relationship. I think that's one of the big differences. The United States is kind of late to the game in Ukraine. 
we are presenting it to the world very much as a three-part uh, war, right? There's Russia, there's Ukraine, and then there's, quote, the West. Um, mm -hmm. China and Taiwan is from get-go a three-way. There's the United States, Taiwan, and, and China. And I think China is smart enough. Everything I know about the Chinese suggests they're smart enough that there's no reason to invade Taiwan, that we would simply need to remind them of the reasons not to invade um, ask them, I would love to ask President Xi exactly what you think you might gain by an attempted invasion. And that attempted is an important word there as well. Don't forget the Russians can drive to Ukraine. Taiwan is separated from the mainland by 100 miles of water. And even today in 2022, an amphibious assault is dramatically factor of, of a thousand more complex and risky than a land invasion. So I'd have plenty to say to both men, but I think it would be a very different conversation. Unlike Joe Biden, unlike what I seem to see the U.S. government's main policy, I don't see the world as evil dictators versus me, the United States, the good guys. Um, I see a world of complexity. And if I were, God help us all, Secretary of State, what day, I would promote a, a process of complexity. So what... Um I think his name is Dean Atchison. He would call these sort of situations of strength where it's like, look, we don't really have a big beef in Syria. In fact, if we go against Assad in Syria, we're going to be on the side of Jabhat al-Nusra or al-Qaeda right. in Syria. However, we have had two big losses. We're bogged down in Afghanistan. We're embarrassed in Iraq. So we need a victory on our side. Here is what a response to this video I heard got you in quite a bit of trouble. Let's watch Hillary Clinton's response oh, no, to no, 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 a no, small no. victory in no, Libya. No, it, no, no, this no, is no. the shortest clip. This is the shortest one. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed rivers. Yes, We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs> And then just one thing, just one thing, Obama says in his book, but what if a government starts massacring not hundreds of its citizens, but thousands, and the United States has the power to stop it? Then what? How do you look at the world through that lens? We have the power to stop it. We came, we saw he died, Libya, Syria. We have these situations where we can do something, shouldn't we? Let me share with your, your listeners why I reacted so strongly. This is like showing Bruce Springsteen the dancing in the dark, clip, you know, <laughs> and say, you know, how did that disco era work out for you, Bruce? You know, I reacted when that clip first appeared. I reacted very strongly, and I wrote a a blog post suggesting that Hillary, after the cameras were turned off, uh, engaged in an act of self pleasure, um, and apparently that was construed as a threat against the Secretary of State. And because she was still a uh, still former first lady, the Secret Service was involved. I got put on a lookout list for the Secret Service. I got frog marched out of the State Department building for fear that I would, you know, somehow break through multiple layers of security with my stapler and, you know, attack her or whatever they actually thought. It was really just an excuse to, to get me out of the building, but it was a particularly colorful excuse. And so that's why uh, I reacted the way you did uh, when you showed that, that the clip. You know, this idea that it's the United States' responsibility to, to right all wrongs is, of course, self-created. We just made that stuff up by ourselves. Second, we apply it very, very, very hypocritically. Um, the Saudis are welcome to run whatever version of a dictatorship they're welcome to run in their country, um, but we don't let the Iranians do the same thing. In fact, Iran has much more democratic processes, certainly in their local elections, than the Saudis do. But nonetheless, we, you know, the Saudis, well, we turn the other uh, cheek, and the Iranians, boo, they're bad people. Um, you know, the dictators that we like do one thing, the dictators we don't like do another, are, are treated a different way. So first problem is it's not, no one's written in stone, it's the U.S.'s job to right all wrongs. Second, we're hypocritical in our application of that. Third, what is a right and a wrong is very rarely as black and white as Obama puts in his book or Americans oftentimes imagine. And last but not least, war is not the only way to fix a problem. Let's say that in country X, We've decided that there is something that they're doing that we don't like. Um, 
going to war or dropping bombs on them is far from the only tool in, in the toolbox. We have, for example, the whole feather uh, bow worth of diplomacy. We have things like sanctions. We have things like, well, if you want to do X and Y, you better stop doing A, B, and, and C. For example, in many smaller countries, a lot of times the dictator's families are in the United States. Their kids are going to Harvard. Um, and you know we have ways of putting pressure on people. Um, we may know all about their bank accounts in, in, in the Panamanian banks or the Grand Caymans and be able to put pressure on them uh, through those means. Before we start dropping bombs and killing people to prevent them from killing other people, I think there's a whole lot of steps. In the case of Hillary Clinton, she was chortling, of course, over the fact that uh, Muammar Gaddafi was sodomized with a knife on national television. And that's where she came up with her, we came, he saw, he died. Um, to watch a national leader brutally killed on TV seems to me to be well below what a former first lady should be doing. And my rude remarks, however uh, ill-intentioned they were, really, I think, fall short of what she did, which was to chortle over the death of someone at knife point. It's almost like one of the big propaganda ploys is to never discuss costs or downsides. So they can say something like, uh, L. Paul Bremer walks out, ladies and gentlemen, we got him. And then that clip plays forever. I mean, heavens, uh, Zarqawi like, takes over portions of Iraq and empowers Al-Qaeda. And he writes a love letter to bin Laden and Zawahiri in Syria. We're siding with Al-Qaeda. Libya, Obama passively mentions, unfortunately, due to a lack of democratic institutions, it became a sort of Wild West afterwards. A sort of wild. There were slave markets that the BBC is reporting on afterwards. That's right. They never talk about the downsides. What are some other propaganda methods we can look out for so we don't get caught in the same quagmire in the Russia-Ukraine situation or China-Taiwan? I think the first time you hear someone talk about using violence for humanitarian purposes, that is the biggest red flag I, I can think of. Um, if you want to go back to Iraq, for example. Uh, Gulf War number three essentially began with the United States claiming that we needed to evacuate the Yazidi uh, people uh, out of northern Iraq to protect them from ISIS. That morphed its way into a full-on U.S. deployment uh, and, and full-on re-engagement in, in Iraq. So the moment you hear someone talking about the U.S. Uh, or, or through, through a proxy of NATO forces, engaging in any kind of violence or potential violence for, quote, a humanitarian purpose, unquote, boy, that is a red flag, run the other way as fast as possible. Second, I think that one of the other red flags is the singularity of reporting from one side. Wars are just terrible things. I had unfortunate experience of witnessing war as a civilian, of seeing up close what it does to human beings, what weapons do to people. It is just an ugly, ugly thing. But when all you're hearing about is the widows from the from our side, if you will, in this case, the uh, the Ukraine, but we never hear about the atrocities that are perpetrated against Russian troops or against Russian civilians or against Ukrainians who are sympathetic to Russians. If you never hear about any of that, um, or if those are simply dismissed as, well, it's uninvestigated, unproven, those are big, big red flags. In particular, in the Ukraine, there was some video which surfaced, which appeared to show Ukrainian soldiers shooting Russian prisoners. Um, I, that was going to be investigated, and there was never been another word said about any of that. Um, in Iraq, our Americans, we ran a program of torture out of Abu Ghraib prison, and really nothing ever came of that. A few low lowlifes uh, went to jail for a while. So when you're seeing anything that's only reporting about atrocities or human rights violations or, or suffering from only one side of a conflict that has two or more sides, that's a big red flag all by itself. I think when you start to see, and we haven't yet kind of gotten to this point, um, we did in Iraq, I think when you start to see the president or senior officials start to cite individual cases, that's a very mm -hmm. classic propaganda technique. You know, while the, the war with Russia and Ukraine is terrible, let's take a look at Mrs. Smolensky and her family. Um, right now, the network news is doing that job for them. But when you see the president mentioning those types of things, when you see uh, 
president on TV bringing up individual cases or parading refugees around, that's a major red flag. What they're doing is they're appealing emotionally to the American people and getting us ready for something that's going to be coming, usually it's something that's going to put American troops in harm's way. One of the most uh, popular diplomats in American history is Henry Kissinger. Niall Ferguson tried to steel man uh, Kissinger's worldview um, on page 23 of this book, Kissinger, the Idealist. He says, the history of things that didn't happen needs to be considered before we may pass any judgment on the history of things that did happen. We need to consider not only the consequences of what the American government did during the Cold War, but also the probable consequences of the different foreign policies that might have been adopted. So, look, I'd like for us to stay out, but had we not, the Soviets would have taken over. If we don't stay out today, China's going to be the one stepping in. How do you respond to that uh, Kissinger thought process? You know, I think that... Again, stepping in, there, there's lots of alternatives to stepping in other than dropping bombs on, on, on people. You take a look, for example, at something that China is doing today, the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it's a program that's designed to build transportation networks across uh, the old Silk Road, across uh, modern Asia, into Africa, across the Middle East. Now, I understand that this is not a perfect program. There are... Uh, accusations of corruption, there's accusations of incompleteness, there's clearly some politics being played here. It's not 100% altruistic. These things never are. As, if anyone has ever given you money, Keith, uh, with a non, with purely for altruistic reasons, please give them my address uh, and, and my bank, my PayPal uh, account as well. I'd like to meet them. So the idea, though, that if during the Cold War, instead of occupying countries militarily, quote, for their protection, unquote, and the United States today, by the way, maintains 750 military bases around the world, the majority of which were put together during the Cold War to protect those countries against the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. So why the 750 bases still exist is a question maybe we should be asking. But nonetheless, if we had spent some portion of that money, and not Peace Corps portions, I mean real portions of that money, millions out of billions for defense, um, on more peaceful initiatives, things that would have really benefited the countries, not pretend to benefit the countries, not airports that we pretend were civil for civilian use that were 90% for military use, nothing like that. I mean, real stuff canals that brought irrigation water to the to deserts, um, train lines that ran from agricultural areas to cities, not with no military use whatsoever. You know, how much further along would we have gotten in terms of pushing the Ruskies back? Because I know that if someone says, hey, I'm coming to your house and I'm going to paint your house for free and I'm going to do your yard for you, um, and then the Russians come and say, we'd like to put a couple of comrades with guns in your yard. And by the way, they're going to dig foxholes in your lawn. Um, I know which side I'm going to feel more sympathetic to. And I know which side I'm, I'd prefer to invite into my house to get to know a little bit better. So when the United States says, you know, we're here and we're going to build a huge military base and we're going to impose our troops on you. And yeah, some of them may go out and commit crimes while they're on R&R. &R. You're just going to have to roll with that because you'll be safe from the Russians. Um, I would just as soon rather have the Chinese out there talking about building a highway through the desert rather than having the Americans apologizing for another incident with our troops. One uh, book that I came across, this was published in 1928. It's called Falsehood in Wartime. He uh, explains there's all these lies in the First World War that he talks about. And he says, now, why is it that all these governments are lying? And he tries to come up with a theory. And I think it applies today. Let me know what you think. He says, sure. Auth authorities in each country do and indeed must resort to this practice of lying in order first to justify themselves by depicting the enemy as an undiluted criminal, and secondly, to inflame popular passion sufficiently to secure recruits for the continuance of the struggle they cannot afford to tell the truth. Is all that's, war based on deception? That's great. Who's the author of that book? Arthur Ponsonby. Oh, heavens, huh. look at that. Uh, Falsehood in Wartime. This oh, was published uh, in 1928. I've got to take a look. I'm not familiar with that. That's really good stuff. Look, you, you've got to simplify war 
because war is one of the passions. You know, you've, you've, the idea of saying, uh, Keith, get out of your chair and go uh, risk your life to do something for me. Um, inherently, there's, there's some kind of molecule in your brain which says, don't put yourself in mortal danger. Um, except for some very, very few special circumstances. If I said, well, it's going to protect your family personally, there's a, a robber in, in the downstairs uh, living room, well, okay, you're, you're going to be ready to go. But if I say, you know, I want you to go out and, and, and kill some people because I personally don't like the way they think, um, that's a harder sell in order for you to put your life on the line. So you've got to simplify it. And the easiest thing to do, and that book from 1928 could have been written by Julius Caesar in, in, in the first century, is you've got to demonize the enemy. They're not the enemy. They're the Nazis. They're not the Germans. They're the Huns. They're not the Iraqis. They're, they're the, the terrorists. They're not the Russians. They're the communists back to reinstate the glory of the Soviet Union. You thought we put them down once, but the mad dog is back. Gaddafi was the bad dog. Don't remember him. And the thing is, is that this, this in, enrages people. It touches them on, on a very guttural level, and you get them going, and you can actually convince someone to put their life on the line because what they're doing is they're putting down a mad dog who's killing his own people. And you've simplified it mm -hmm. to the point where shoving a bayonet into that person seems to make sense to an otherwise rational human being. And all those propaganda techniques we discussed earlier and all the hundreds of others which, which are employed, the same techniques, war after war after war, um, are pretty much the same thing. You're starting to see that, by the way, just to kind of bring this full circle, you're starting to see that more and more in, in our politics. Um, in both campaigns against Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden sought to portray Trump not as an adversary with different ideas. You remember John McCain calling Barack Obama a good man. We just don't just we just don't agree on everything. Those days are gone. Donald Trump, uh, according to Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and whoever runs against him in 2024, Donald Trump is a Russian asset. He's a sleeper for the Kremlin. He's a Russian sympathizer. He is a crook, a criminal. He belongs behind bars. He is an evil man. He's a, a child molester. My goodness, they've gone as far as accusing him of having or wanting to have sex with his own daughter. So you get to the point where you're demonizing now more and more in American society. Tucker Carlson uh, is demonized on a regular basis. You don't have to like him. You don't have to even listen to him. But my goodness, he's just, a, he's just another man on TV. He's a, he's a TV announcer who happens to have one set of opinions as opposed to another. Nobody's out there claiming that Wolf Blitzer is a pedophile or, or, or Anderson Cooper uh, you know, had a relationship with his with his children or something like that. But they feel free to say that about Tucker Carlson. They feel free to say that about Donald Trump. And that demonization reminds me far, far too much of what has become part and parcel of our road to war in the United States, which is to demonize our enemies. You're seeing it now with Vladimir Putin. I hope it doesn't lead to war the same way it has in other instances. Do you have time for one more? Absolutely. Uh, you wrote a novel, Ghosts of Tom Joad, a story of the 99%. It's a novel. I know you don't have a thesis. What is the message of this book that people should appreciate? It's a novel that is based on facts, and it is a story of the United States in the 1970s and 80s. It's all told through a single family, um, as John Steinbeck's uh, uh, Grapes of Wrath was told through the eyes of the Joad family, and they talked about the Dust Bowl and the Depression. My book talks about a, what happened to the United States in the 70s and 80s that created what we call the Rust Belt, the hollowing out of America, the point where we no longer cared about supporting one another and instead saw that there was a giant sucking sound and the money was being pulled upward to create what ultimately became known as the 1%. Today we know them as the 0.1%. Once upon a time in America, in the 1960s and 70s, the majority of Americans were able to support themselves with the jobs that they were able to, to work at, whether that was in a factory or doing trades work or selling paint, as my father did. Uh, my father was a paint salesman, and he put two kids through college, had a nice house in the burbs, so we had two cars as a kid growing up. 
and he sold paint. This was not exactly the kind of job that you think would yield a debt-free lifestyle, but that's in fact what it did back in that time when our economy was more balanced and our government was more interested in helping maintain those balances. Ghosts of Tom Joad is about the hollowing out of America and the changes that took place at the highest levels in order to defeat people at the lowest levels. I fictionalize it to hopefully make it a little more readable than an econ textbook, um, and in hopes that someday maybe someone will find a way to make a movie out of it. And you didn't just uh, wax uh, poetically. You took a minimum wage job at age 53 to write this thing. So more. I... Uh, so uh, I, the second I read that article, I said, all right, I'll buy this book and take the time to read it. More than that, I live for most of the summer in my car as a semi-homeless person in order to understand the, the, the differences and the problems that were encountered by decent people who mm -hmm. were trying to make a living but had lost their, their place of living. Um, I hung out with workers in West Virginia who were also living in their cars and their campers. These were not people who had gotten addicted to drugs or who were mentally ill, you know, the kind of homeless you see on the subway system in New York City, for example. These were men and, and, and women who basically had the economy drop them and they were canceled. They mm -hmm. lost their jobs, which meant they lost their homes, and the only shelter they could find was to live in their cars. And I spent most of the summer among them, uh, primarily in the Weirton, West Virginia area, and whole sections of the book were informed by that experience uh, and the information that I learned from living among them, as well as taking those minimum wage jobs as a 50-year-old. The website is wemeantwell.com. Thanks to everyone for watching Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute. Mr. Van Buren, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you or, very Peter. much for having me, Peter. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. That trust is well placed. The enemies you confront will come to know your skill and bravery. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men women and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. I want Americans and all the world to know that coalition forces will make every effort to spare innocent civilians from harm. A campaign on the harsh terrain of a nation as large as California could be longer and more difficult than some predict. And helping Iraqis achieve a united, stable, and free country will require our sustained commitment. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. I know that the families of our military are praying that all those who serve will return safely and soon. Millions of Americans are praying with you for the safety of your loved ones and for the protection of the innocent. For your sacrifice, you have the gratitude and respect of the American people. And you can know that our forces will be coming home as soon as their work is done. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. We will meet that threat now 
with our Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines so that we do not have to meet it later with armies of firefighters and police and doctors on the streets of our cities. Now that conflict has come, the only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. My fellow citizens, the dangers to our country and the world will be overcome. We will pass through this time of peril and carry on the work of peace. We will defend our freedom. We will bring freedom to others, and we will prevail. May God bless our country and all who defend her.
From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. It was just over 90 minutes beyond President Bush's deadline for Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq that U.S. warships and planes, there were F-117 stealth bombers involved, launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The attack came in waves, cruise missiles, followed by the F-117 stealth bombers with so-called bunker-busting bombs. Their target, a bunker believed to be sheltering what are called top leaders of the Iraqi regime. Now, this is what it looked and sounded like in Baghdad. It was this short, and this is what happened. 